Hi, I'm Leslie McVeigh, and welcome to CTN Member Highlights. Today, my guests are Dana Totman, the President and CEO of Avesta Housing. Hi, Dana. Hi. And Mark Swan, who is the Executive Director of Preble Street. Good morning. Welcome to both of you. And today, we're going to uh, talk about housing first which is something I'm just sort of learning about. Um, and maybe you can explain it and then talk about how you've combined forces on this project. Sure. Sure, uh, I'll start. Uh, uh, Housing First is, you know, simply put, it's the solution to chronic homelessness and it's the, it's the best work uh, we've ever done. You know, when we opened Logan Place, 12 years ago now, that was sort of a light bulb moment for the organization, uh, for me personally. Like, okay, we can really do something here to, to put a stop to what had been an increasing number of people at the shelter. We could actually reverse that, and we did when we opened Logan Place. And uh, really, it's, it's kind of a simple model, but it's also complex. Uh, up till this model, you know, what happened was when somebody was homeless, um, they needed to be housing ready and they needed to sort of have a lot of things in place before there was any housing programs available to them. They needed to be uh, seeing a case manager. They needed to be, uh, to have a Medicaid card. They needed to be sober. They needed an employment plan. They needed all these signs of stability that we would all want. Right. Like they're all good but it, things. It sounds overwhelming. Well, for some people, you know, and, and it's it is important to say for eighty percent of the people who come into our shelters, that works. And mm -hmm. you know, within three weeks they're out of the shelter. I mean, I don't think most people know that, but you know, the average person coming into our soup kitchen or our shelter is out of that system within three weeks. Mm -hmm. But it's the chronically homeless at fifteen or twenty percent that are just stuck. They're stuck in the shelter, and so we might want them to get sober. We might want them to have all these pieces of stability in place, but they don't. Um, and it's really because of untreated mental illness mm -hmm. and really deep, deep addictions um, that are also untreated. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're, they're not able, their functioning level is such that they're not going to take all those steps. So they're stuck in shelters for years, yeah. decades even, and their lives are tragic and sad. So the housing first m model, real quick, is to sort of reverse, put that all on its head and say, well, rather than have all these things in place, we're going to give you an opportunity for housing first mm -hmm. and then work on these other issues. And then, you know, once you're yeah. stable, once you have housing, once you have a sacred place called home, uh -huh. you can start to heal. Yeah. And maybe at that point you can get sober, you can get help, right. you can start to deal with your long-term mental illness. And we found it works. It's yeah. been a miracle. It is, it's a great, great uh, and approach and program. We'll talk a little bit more about what community means and what the services yeah. are after we talk to Dana a little bit about how you and Mark got together. Sure. Uh, in, in 2003, we moved our offices from uh, Gorham to uh, downtown Portland at the corner of uh, Cumberland Ave and, and Elm Street. And uh, uh, I had uh, known Mark and Preble Street um, throughout my, my career, particularly when I was working at Maine State Housing Authority. So we started having coffee regularly at the public market when, when it was open across the street. And um, we were kind of kicking around ideas. And essentially, we landed on this idea that let's try to do a housing first development. And what it really did is it brought, I think, two organizations that kind of stuck to what they did well and brought that to the table. And so Preble Street clearly knows how to, to work with, with, with clients, how to advocate on their behalf, how to serve them, how to be good social workers, how to do case management. We don't know how to do that. We know how to develop housing. We know how to build housing. We know how to manage housing. But we don't um, do sort of direct person-to-person -person work. So we brought what we thought was their strength with our strength and came upon this idea. We sort of made a, a, an agreement early on that this is going to be housing for us. We know there are going to be opportunities to, well, how about if we give you this money and you build it, but we want the people to be sober when they move in? Or how about if we give you this money, but we want you to only allow them to stay six months. Each layer of money would bring different restrictions. And we said, no, we're not going to take um, 
those, those opportunities, and we're going to stay true to what we're trying to do here so that we can really serve those that have been homeless for the longest periods of time <laughs> and, and to get them into housing. And so we kind of brought our, our two organizations together and spent about three years planning and designing and conceiving Logan Place, um, which opened in, in 2005, and now we've done Florence House and Houston Commons as well. But I think the key to our relationship is Preble Street doesn't really do or know how to house do housing development, um, and they're far stronger at um, serving people's needs mm -hmm. um, directly than, than we are, so we bring the best of what we have together and stay true to what our objectives are. And the newest project is Houston? Houston Commons. Houston yeah. Commons. And that is going to be, have 24-hour services available mm -hmm. for the people who are living there. Yep, all of all the programs do. They have 24-hour uh, social work staff to support people and mm -hmm. be there if and when they need help, mm -hmm. need support, um, and to just really help build a community. And that's one of the the beautiful things about this model that we've seen it at all at the first two, and we're starting to see already at Houston Commons is people really do kind of develop relationships and watch out for each other and the tenants you know take ownership of the of the yeah. of the building of the facility of the neighborhood um, you know at Logan Place the tenants there for 10 years now have planted tulips the whole length of the street um, just to beautify the whole neighborhood um, and really the sort of the empowerment that happens yeah. is just a, a beautiful thing to and watch. And they become family to each other. Yeah. Yeah. And do. I was reading on the web page for Logan Place about the sort of the progression, the first year, the second year, the third year, and then the art, the tenants' art started coming up right. on the walls. I mean, it, they really yeah. embraced it. And how lovely is that? It, it, it really is. And, and what a lot of people don't realize is the staff that are there, um, and, and that was uh, critical that they be there 24 mm -hmm. hours. Much of them, their, the staff presence is to help folks um, succeed and develop that sense of community, but at the same time, people's previous lives before moving into uh, Logan Place or Florence House or Houston Commons has been kind of living on the streets and, and living in a, a, a unhealthy environment. Um, perhaps with relationships that, that aren't healthy or contributing to, to one's success in any means. And so while they're trying to create new community, they're also kind of letting go of another community, not a very good one, right. but um, so those, those staff sometimes have to kind of keep former friends from visiting and disrupting what now is, is, is a new life. And, mm -hmm. Uh, oftentimes the residents themselves don't have the strength or the confidence to say no you can't visit now or no you can't yeah. come do that here but that staff will and they'll sort of help protect those so those new people. residents so yeah. they're kind of letting go of a unhealthy life on the streets yeah. um, and starting this new community um, which really does have some magic to it whether it's you know, a, a Super Bowl pool on, on, on the wall of picking the numbers uh -huh. or, or watching the Kentucky Derby or, or the Oscars. Mm -hmm. they, they have sort of wonderful social events um, in those, those communities. Safe That's place. very precious. Yeah. And I know that at Florence House anyway, and maybe the other two places, they do have emergency beds. Um, Florence House is a little different yes, because right. it's for women. Um, and that's a unique situation and a very important one. Um, for a woman to be alone on the street can be very dangerous. Not that it isn't for a man, right. but the women have a few more challenges. Oh, absolutely. Um, their, uh, their vulnerability is ratcheted up, you know, quite a bit. We, right. we know more than half the women that we serve at Florence House have a history of recent um, uh, domestic violence and or sexual abuse on the street yeah. um, while trying to survive. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a very vulnerable group. Yeah. And, and Florence House is a little different. It's, it's got the housing first apartments, mm -hmm. um, but it also has uh, a, an emergency shelter yeah. component to it, as well as a safe haven program, which are f for women uh, primarily who are suffering from long-term untreated mental illness who are on the streets for years. And as much as we're hoping and wanting them to 
get into the housing first apartments they're they're still reluctant to do so so rather than just rely on a shelter bed we've built sort of semi-private spaces half walls it's really quite designed quite well where they have their own place to kind of that they can count on every night first of all um, but they can also make their own they can nest a little bit they can put pictures up on the walls there's a bureau for them so it's mm -hmm. it's not a shelter bed but it's not quite an apartment mm -hmm. um, but they're going to be there they'll be safe uh, it'll be their space every night with the ultimate goal and it does happen sometimes that they do end up moving into an apartment because they've built mm -hmm. trust they've built relationships with the staff um, and when an apartment becomes available um, we're hopeful that we can convince them to move in there's kind of an art to it now with the housing first how do how do you select who's going in mm. and also how long a period can people stay there is it as long as they need or forever or how does that sure. work I'll, I'll answer the second part first okay. and, and mark can answer <laughs> mm -hmm. the first part um, people can stay there um, for as long as they want um, mm -hmm. so long as they um, abide by the the rules and the lease terms and and um, it's working so this is intended to be permanent housing um, for for those that were chronically homeless and some do um, have their lives um, get into a better order and are able to move on and live independently some um, oftentimes um, unfortunately end up passing away in in their unit here and moving on to a long-term care because they do have many um, the residents have a number of physical um, illnesses that we, we've discovered um, somewhat surprisingly after they moved in but the intent is that this is their home in most cases they could never manage an apartment larger than the efficiency apartment they have and at the same time um, they do very well in this sense of this community with that level of support there um, and in most cases, they would not succeed um, back on the streets or living independently. Yeah. They need this level of, of support um, so they can stay as um, long as they can. In fact, we have um, 85 different developments at Avesta Housing for, for seniors and for a workforce and for a, a variety of folks. And our longest term um, tenants tend to be at um, these, these three, three developments. So yeah. people tend to stay longer there which is a good thing it is good yeah, yeah the, the number one reason that people have left these housing first apartments is because they've died yeah. um, it is we actually had five deaths at Logan Place just last year oh. out of 30 apartments yeah. which I think speaks to the yeah. the the vulnerability of these folks yeah. and the so level fragile. of yeah. you know years and years of untreated medical mm -hmm. issues um, but your question of how do we decide it yeah. is one of the hardest things we do at Pebble Street. It's, it's yeah. wrenching. Um, the list for the 30 units at Houston Commons, I think it ended up at about 120 people mm -hmm. who met the, met the criteria of chronically homeless in years on the street. And basically we looked at the 30 most vulnerable. You know, we didn't cream. We didn't take people we thought would be successful. We took people who were the most in need with medical issues, um, uh, psychiatric issues, substance abuse problems, and really we're almost playing God, like who yeah. are the 30 people yeah. that we're going to save really. here, um, oh. because it is a life-saving yeah. opportunity for I mean, people. It would be so hard. We need five more Housing yeah. First developments yeah. tomorrow. Okay, well, get well, busy. <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah. trying. We, we will. What, what yeah. a lot of people don't realize is how much money we save uh, by keeping the right. residents out of the emergency oh, rooms, yes. out of jail, yes. the, the, the cost savings um, associated with these developments is just incredible. Yeah. And, and we really have having extensive data that just demonstrates it costs far less to house somebody than it does to not house them. Um, so it, it really, obviously, it saves lives and changes lives dramatically, but the cost savings to the community, to the state, to, to, to our, our governments is just incredible. And that's the re-education of the public that we need yes. to do 
to, yeah. to make them and understand. And our policymakers. Yeah. That's oh, who really need yes, to understand yes, this. So I important. Mean, Maine is one of the very few states in the country that has not yeah. really endorsed and adopted and supported this model. And we yeah. were very discouraged. We had a bill uh, for Housing First yep. funding this past session mm -hmm. and went through the legislature. We got a, uh, it was passed, um, but the governor vetoed it. Yeah. Um, and the legislature did not override yeah. the veto. So well, it, the, it steps a, backwards yeah, is, it is happening backwards. in the state yeah. uh, over and over again. Well, I thank you both for what you do, and you need to come on again because this wasn't long enough. <laughs> we need to talk more. There's so much more to, to let people know about, and uh, we will do to. that. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you.